Did you know that Psalm 68 says, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. And then a verse after that, it says, but let his children be glad and rejoice because God's got good things for them. Isn't that good news that you know that God is on your side and he's taking care of us? He's looking after us. So let's just pray with that in mind. Father, we just thank you that, Lord, you defeat our enemies of sickness and of disease and of war and of all the things that the enemy would try to bring against us and our families. But Lord God, you're on our side. And God, we're called and you're telling us to rejoice, to be glad in you. Lord, to rejoice that this is the day that you have made and there's good things that you have in store for your people. Even in the midst of all the chaos, you still have good things for us. So Father, we believe we receive that. And as we hear your word today, Father God, may it bring strength to our hearts and may, Father God, it bring a whole new intelligent approach to your way of praying and communicating and authorizing heavenly uh, heavenly goodness here on earth. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Today, we begin this series, Pray With Results. It's a little acronym, PWR, power, right? Power, Pray With Results, part one, this first segment. This is so exciting and what a great topic to dial in on. Prayer, praying with results, power. Don't you want to pray and get results? I mean like to move things, things to happen, change the world for good, for the better, for God's glory. One fellow, he prayed and he said, dear God, Please give me some patience this instant. I mean now. P.S. Hurry it up. <laughs> Another guy, he revised the serenity prayer and he prayed this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the ability to change the people that I just can't stand. Amen. <laughs> Unfortunately, some people actually do pray like that in all seriousness. Martin Luther, the famous German theologian from the 15th century, he once said this. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his willingness. Wow. You see, when I was a boy, my mom, she would give me what we called a talking to regarding my tendency to worry. I had a problem with worry. She would say, Stephen, you're making something out of nothing. Other times she'd say to me, now you're making a mountain out of a molehill. I can hear her saying that right now. Of course, I took it as correction and understood that she was telling me to stop amplifying the problem. She was a good mom. She was giving me some wise advice. She was telling me, quit making a problem where there really isn't a problem. Yes, I really did have a problem with casting my care. In fact, it was so bad that I'd worry about being worried. I'd have panic attacks over being so anxious, troubled, fretting, careful, worried. But over the years of meditating on God's word, I began to consider Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and it says this, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, proving what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Something strange began happening in me when I began just really dialing in on that verse. I began to see the rebuke, you're making something out of nothing that my mom would give me as a benefit instead of a liability. You're making something out of nothing. Think about that. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. You know what? That could be a potential superpower. I love mountains. Imagine making another Teton mountain range out of practically a shovel of dirt. That really is a superpower, making something out of nothing. You see, it's true. Worry, fear, anxiety all have the power to make something bad out of nothing. But faith, faith in God, trust in God, that also has the power to make something very, very good, beautiful out of nothing. That's how God created in the beginning. He released faith by his word, making something out of nothing. Now, when I say nothing, I mean nothing materialistic. God's word is always latent with superpower. 
God is his word. You know, John 1 says the word was God, not just with God, but the word was God. Jeremiah 1 verse 12 says God watches over his word to perform it. God's looking for his word here on earth. So yes, in a way, something out of nothing, but scientifically we know that all matter is made up of energy. The atom, check this out, is the basic building block of all matter. And you know what happens when we split the tiny atom. We get this ridiculous release of power because of a chain reaction. The experts tell us that the mass of a paperclip, think about this, imagine it now, the mass of a paperclip has roughly the energy of 18 kilotons of TNT. That's about the size of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945. That's a big, terrible something out of practically nothing. And now that same technology of splitting atoms is used in nuclear reactors around the world, bringing power in the form of electricity to light up cities, heat homes, and to charge even your EV. Something out of nothing. From the beginning of creation, God has modeled for us the art of energy making matter, the invisible creating what's visible. Yes, my dear scientific friends, God is the owner of the Big Bang, except it's not just a theory. God released an unimaginable amount of power at the beginning of creation, but it was an intelligent explosion of order and light creating a universe according to his plan. Even Genesis 1 verse 1 says, God created the heavens before the earth. Our modern discovery of the expanding universe has already had the sequence perfectly described by an ancient book called the Bible. Genesis 1 is so flawless in its orderly account that mathematicians have been persuaded to a faith in God. How? By measuring the accuracy of biblical accounts with ratios and probabilities. It's jaw-dropping. Science must concede, sometimes grudgingly, that the Bible sequence of order for habitable life is a flawless written account by none other than the intelligent designer himself. Yes, you got it. God, something out of nothing. So what does creation have to do with prayer? Well, prayer is an intelligent release of power here on earth. Prayer is human interference with an earthly trajectory to bring heavenly influence here on earth. If you don't understand this, you can wrongly think and try to use prayer to double down on an earthly godless agenda. We can all see in the context of this conversation that would not be heavenly and therefore any prayer like that would be a contradiction of God's will. That means it would be, it would be labeled anti-God or even anti-Christ. For example, prayer is not to manipulate others or control others. That's actually witchcraft. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Look at this. Now the works of the flesh, or you could say carnality, are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication. It lists some more. And then verse 20, idolatry, that's worshiping other gods, witchcraft, that's controlling, manipulating um, people, and hatred. Look at that. God is the source of everything good and every perfect, everything perfect, the book of James says. Power is good and it's meant for good, but the moment power is used to hijack your free will, to coerce or manipulate, no matter how justifiable you may think it is, it's evil. God, who is all wise and loving, he won't use his supreme power to control or manipulate us. So why do religious people try to do this? Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And yet Jesus won't resort to control tactics and override your free will. You know the old saying, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's only the pursuit of power void of God's oversight, void of his love. 
You were made for power, and that's why praying with results, let me say that again, praying with results is so critical to your design, but you have to be trained to use that power or you'll abuse it. Yes, you can pray wrong prayers, even bad prayers, manipulative, controlling, evil prayers. Look at James chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. You are jealous and covet, and your desires go unfulfilled. So you become murderers. To hate is to murder as far as your hearts are concerned. You burn with envy and anger and are not able to obtain the gratification and the happiness that you seek. So you fight and you war. You do not have, listen to this, you do not have because you do not ask. He's talking about a prayer. You don't ask God with a prayer. Then verse 3, or you do ask God, that's a prayer for what you want, and yet you fail to receive. Why? Because you ask with wrong purpose or wrong motives and evil, selfish motives. Your intention is to spend it in sensual pleasures. So if God were to answer that prayer, it would actually be destructive to your life, to your family, your future. God is saying, yes, it's possible to pray evil prayers motivated by jealousy and hate. Don't do it, he's saying. It could hurt you. It will hurt you and it'll hurt others. Of course, God doesn't empower those prayers, but it does you damage. How? Well, it starts to welcome something called cognitive dissonance into your soul. Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is a common phenomenon that occurs in people's lives much more often than you would really even think. Experts describe cognitive dissonance as basically the internal war within a person when their beliefs directly oppose their words or actions or behavior. You're believing one thing, but you're doing another thing. Think of it. When your beliefs oppose your actions, then you experience great stress and the pain of cognitive dissonance. We naturally try to move away from pain. That means something's got to give. You tolerate yourself being internally pulled apart, drawn and quartered mentally. Let's say you've got a young woman with this idealistic belief that morality and truth are not just preferences, but she actually believes that it's a personal conviction. It's important. She starts dating a guy who strongly influences her to compromise her moral standards, her ethics. And as she pursues what she hopes is light, love, she's trying to decide that this is love, her actions with this guy sharply contradict her true beliefs. She longs for relief from the psychological stress, from the mental and pain and the pressure. So she begins the process of trying to rewrite her morality and shift her perception of her truths to make the relationship justifiable because after all, it is love, isn't it? It She wants it to be even virtuous, what she's doing. The problem is, She's pulling herself apart. She's dismantling the faith that makes her strong. Her belief system is being cannibalized. Now, before we get sanctimonious and thinking, well, I, I'd, I'd never do that, Pastor Stephen. No, I would never do this. This is exactly the same process that hijacks our faith and causes our prayers to be weak and futile and do nothing. Religion justifies prayers that don't get answered by inventing doctrine that contradict Jesus' words. Sure, it's convenient and comforting in the moment to think prayer is just a roll of the spiritual dice. Oh, sometimes you win and sometimes, oh, you lose. Well, who knows what God's going to do, right? Has cognitive dissonance hobbled your faith? Maybe it's not that God hasn't answered, but that faith hasn't honestly been employed. Think of this, Romans 10, verse 10. With the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So in other words, outcome isn't triggered until there is true cognitive harmony between what you believe or faith in your heart and then what you speak with your words, what you authorize with your words. Once again, let's read James 4, starting at verse 1 through 3. 
he asks a question, what leads to the unending quarrels and conflicts among you? And not just among you as people, but even mentally. He's saying, what, what, what's going on in the inside, the quarrel that's going on in your brain, in your thoughts, pulling you apart? Do they not come from your hedonistic desires that wage war in your bodily members fighting for control over you? I mean, he's dialing in on cognitive dissonance here. Verse two, you are jealous and you covet what others have and you your lust goes unfulfilled, so you murder, at least in your thoughts. You are envious and you can't obtain the objective of your envy, so you fight and you battle on the inside. You do not have because you do not ask. Verse three, you ask God for something and you don't receive it. Why? Because you ask with wrong motives out of selfish or with an unrighteous agenda so that when you get what you want, you may spend it on your hedonistic desires or in other words, desires that would destroy your life, things that would hurt you. Look, I, I, when I read this, I, something in my heart just says, praise God, this is encouraging. Some of you might say, is it? Is this really encouraging? It is, because finally we've got answers why we're praying and nothing is moving. We've got a bad case of spiritual cognitive dissonance. And as soon as we get our soul untied from the craziness, we get down to getting stuff moving around here. When we believe right, we can speak right. We can pray right. So here's a big one, praying for leaders so that you can enjoy the results of praying for leaders, which the word says in Timothy is, is a peaceful life. There's been too much human manipulation regarding this subject. Praying for those in leadership. Praying for someone does not mean that you're sanctioning someone. Can I say that again? Praying for an individual does not mean that you're sanctioning the actions of an individual. Can you imagine being a Christian living in Germany in the 1930s as Hitler is taking over the country? He's the leader. He's the leader of the country. His right-hand man, Joseph Goebbels, was the chief propagandist for the Nazi party, and he made sure that the media of the day, the radio, the newspapers, anything that was considered media, he made sure that it made Hitler seem like he was the loving savior of the German people, a father to the hungry and to the hopeless. What a demonic load of lies. And yet, many Christian leaders in Germany in that day, not all, but many fell into the trap of manipulating their congregations into supporting Hitler with the whole notion of praying for their leaders. Let's see what God's word actually says about this. Before we read 1 Timothy chapter 2, you should know that Paul the apostle just warned Timothy, his protege in the previous chapter, that there were vain, corrupt leaders who were intent on deceiving and manipulating. He even named two individuals specifically saying that he had prayed to turn them over to Satan so that they could basically learn the hard way. My goodness. Prayers for all leaders need to be in line with God's agenda, not your preferences, not your personal opinion, but with God's agenda. Never become spiritually complicit in another's crimes against justice. So 1 Timothy 2, starting at verse 1 through 5. First of all, then, I admonish and urge the, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all men. For kings and all who are in positions of authority or high responsibility, that outwardly we may pass a quiet and undisturbed life, and inwardly a peaceable one in all godliness and reverence and seriousness in every way. For such praying is good and right, and it pleases, it's pleasing and acceptable to God our Savior, who wishes all men to be saved and increasingly to perceive and recognize and discern and know precisely and correctly the divine truth. Not the cultural truth, the divine truth. For there is only one God. You see, praying for someone doesn't mean you trust that someone or you trust that person. In fact, Jeremiah 17 verse 5 says this, that you are cursed if you put your trust in people. Verse 7 says you are blessed if you trust in God. What do you want to be? Cursed or blessed? 
There is never a right time to move your trust equity from God and place it into mankind. If you want answers for your health, for example, for your family's health, you don't put all of your trust in a doctor or in a a man or a woman. You trust in God. God uses doctors, but you put your trust in God. Do you want direction for your finances? Don't put your trust in an advisor. You put your trust in God. God will direct you to the right advisor, but you keep your trust equity fully in God. Do you want answers for the political system here on earth? Stop trusting in people. Trust in God. Do you want a job? Do you want a career, a relationship, a future? Stop trusting in human beings and put all of your trust in God. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? All of your heart. To be religious is opposed to you being powerful. What do you want to be, religious or powerful? So why do I say that? Because religion doesn't get supernatural results, but it can get popular approval. And for some people, they would choose that over Jesus any day. Do you hunger for approval from people? Take that desire to God and ask him to shift it from a lateral need for recognition to a vertical pursuit for heavenly connection. You were designed by God to walk with God. You weren't made for mob rule or societal coercion. Just a general rule of thumb here. But religious people tend to have a driving desire to control others. They may call it ministry, but pushing people is not shepherding people. Pushing people is not shepherding people. Jesus never pushes He leads. That means you have the choice to either follow or go the other way. You've heard me stress this in other series, but choice is essential to your God design and activation of authority. You can't love or obey or trust God unless it's the choice that you make. That means you have to own the option to not love God, not obey God, or to love him and to obey him. Jesus leads us, but it's up to you to follow him. Now, truly empowered people do not, they do not try to control others. They know that that's not God's way. And the very act or motive of trying to control others is actually witchcraft. Witchcraft is not of God and will completely short circuit your ability to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Witchcraft, a Jezebel spirit, is controlling, manipulative, demanding, coercive, and makes, um, make no mistake about this, it is anti-Christ, therefore it is anti-true life and freedom. Demonic powers can imitate supernatural powers and have a counterfeit type of sign and wonder, but it's in complete opposition to God's great plans for your life. It ends in spiritual death. Demons promote sickness, poverty, disease, infirmity, mental brokenness, and all kinds of addictions. They want power over your life. God wants you free, whereas the devil wants you enslaved to his will. Jesus said the devil is the father of lies who has come to steal, kill, and destroy. What kind of supernatural power do you want flowing in your life? Ask yourself, do you want good or evil? I sometimes think of prayers as spiritual word formulas. Children often express a great desire for the supernatural. They're born with it. It's inherent. That's why books and entertainment are full of stories with sorcery, spells, witchcraft to try to satisfy that insatiable imagination of children. It's dangerous and in opposition to their God design. You've heard me say many times, life does not tolerate a vacuum. If we don't teach children that God empowers us as his children to release spiritual authority through prayers and decrees, then what do you think will happen to their curiosity? If you don't fill the void with truth, it will get hijacked by evil agenda to pursue wrong thinking. Wrong thinking leads to wrong talking. Now, There's a cognitive dissonance and the world wonders why children are killing children. They're acting out on their video games. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says this, 
Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it and indulge it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words. We were made for power, but I'll say it again. You've got to know God to properly use it. Kids, listen to me. Children, listen to me. Your words are powerful either for death or life. Learn from God how to speak blessings, not curses. Learn to speak life, not death. Jesus teaches us how to even speak to mountains in Mark 11. Jesus teaches us how to use our words to pray for the sick. Never use your words for evil, to hurt people, but always to use, use your words for faith, to trust in God and honor Him. Anyone who uses their beliefs to disobey God always ends up hurting themselves. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. When you trust in the Lord, then you go to his word to learn how to use his words properly. Many people who call themselves Christians are so Bible illiterate that they don't know how or they don't learn how to use their words properly. Think of the word prayer. What is prayer? Well, basically, it's a sequence of words that expresses outwardly your faith inwardly. Fairy tales teach children incantations that turn the frog into a prince, or vice versa. This power has an attraction to kids. Why? Because they're often born into difficult situations where we all need to be able to turn our frog situation into a prince situation. We are all inherently looking for a life conversion to royal status. It takes years of disappointment to dull and mute that desire. God has ridiculous great plans for your life, but it requires power. Or as we're talking about here, a supernatural word formula that activates God's will here on earth. Why do you think Jesus taught the disciples to pray a specific prayer to activate God's will? Well, if God's will is automatically done, why pray it? Why do we need a spiritual word formula? God has given you and me authority here on earth. Mix your free will choice to obey or disobey with the knowledge that you have legal right to authorize right or wrong here on earth. Boom. Are you getting why it's so important to authorize God's will on earth? God is looking for a man or a woman or a boy or a girl to believe and speak his will so he can help and save this world. When you see evil happening, know this. Too many people are misusing their authority in combination with too many people doing nothing with their authority. We have passive agents of God's kingdom tolerating a vacuum, and so all kinds of chaos and disorder is being unleashed. When Jesus was in the boat with the disciples and a storm was almost causing it to sink in the angry wind and the waves, what did Jesus do? Did he wait for a good witch to come along? Did he call on the powers of Pokemon or Harry Potter? No. Absolutely not. He stood up and he censured and rebuked the winds and the waves. And the wind and the waves quickly obeyed him. God gives you and me power and authority. This is ridiculously exciting. In the next segment, I'm going to give you a toolbox with seven specific tools for a power prayer. You're going to love this. Make time to join me as we learn to use these seven power tools for power prayers. Because guess what? We want to pray with results. That's the point of this. That's right. It's time for your life to be marked by heavenly outcomes, heavenly results. Remember Peter Parker, Spider-Man's secret alter ego? He worked for this gruff editor-in-chief, Mr. Jameson, and, and Mr. Jameson would chomp on his cigar and he'd slam his fist down the desk saying, Parker, I want results. Get me results. <laughs> well, you should be like that, except without the chomping on the cigar. Faith, you should be saying, Faith, I want results. I'm going to get God results. That's the way you should be. Never be content with zero outcome or you're on your way to just a vain religion today. You can pray a miracle prayer with me that releases amazing power into your situation. Jesus taught his disciples this. Let you and I start right now by praying the Lord's Prayer that he taught his disciples in Matthew chapter 6. Pray along with me. Pray this out loud. I want you to hear your voice. Pray it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.